Yes, good, good afternoon. I'm pleased to see that so many people are still here. And um, with that topic, it's a little bit hard to compete to uh, Jean-Alain Rosette, who presented exciting data. Um, this topic is going a little bit more into psychology, and it's overall a little bit softer. Um, but nevertheless, I think it's very important that we actually um, know how important compliance is, and that we actually have tools um, which allow us to increase compliance to our patients. And pro one problem I encountered by preparing that talk is there's not a lot of hard data out there. There are not a lot of valid studies. Everything is kind of vague, and I needed to look, uh, dig deep into uh, the databases and into the internet to find something um, reasonably. So um, let's uh, start with the opening words. Um, without compliance, doctors and medicine are impotent. And that's actually a medical professor from Germany who has said that Linus Geisler, and I think this um, is very nice, fits very nice into a urology conference, um, impotence of doctors without compliance of um, the patient. So um, I will give you a road map before we start off that you know what we're talking of. Um, first, you will have a definition of compliance. I'm sure everybody has a known definition of compliance, but I'm going to show you what is the most widely accepted definition of compliance. Then, um, we're going to have a quick look at incidence, recurrence, prevention, and costs of urethiasis. Then, we're going to look at the five dimensions of compliance. I'm sure everybody's aware of those. Um, we look at the compliance in general in medicine. What is the compliance? What do we know? How good are people or the patients complying to the advice or the medication we prescribe. And we look at how is compliance in urethiasis, and we have a quick look how we can improve compliance. Okay, crack on quickly. What is compliance? Everybody can could now, what would be the time to make his mind up and have a quick thought, what everybody thinks, what is compliance? And that's the um, widely accepted standard set by the WHO. Um, correspondence with agreed recommendations from the healthcare provider. And um, I want to highlight agreed, because you agree, um, the patient agrees um, with your recommendations, and you both need to be in a dialogue, and you need to um, find maybe a compromise. Not every patient will be willing to undergo the um, procedure or the medication you think is best for him. So you need to have a good and fruitful dialogue. So quick, um, some quick words to um, incidence, recurrence, and prevention. So we know the lifetime risk is around 10% in Europe. Men are more frequently involved than women. And we have an amazing high recurrence rate. Half of the patients we see, they will re have a recurrence. So. Um, 75% of those recurrences could most likely be prevented if people would comply to simple measures like high fluid intake, um, appropriate uh, diet, um, reducing the weight, um, metabolic, avoiding metabolic syndrome, um, and 25% would need specific pharmacologic measures to prevent a recurrence. Um, those are, this is data from the states. Two billion dollars annually um, we pay or the state pays for um, urethiasis. And that was 2005. And incidence is rising and costs are getting higher. Um, and in those numbers, there's not yet the loss of productivity caused by a patient having a stone, an acute episode, or having a JJ stand. Okay, what are the five dimensions of compliance? So the WHO has looked into that and um, uh, stated there are five factors involved. There are, for example, let's start just at the bottom on the patient-related factors. Um, what are the social and economic um, circumstances the patient is living in? What is his religion? What are his beliefs? Um, what does he think is good for him? What experience did he make previously, or what experience did his family members make, his peer group. Then we have condition-related factors. Um, is the condition on a condition which affects the patient severely? For example, hypertension. A lot of people have hypertension and live with it, and they feel actually very well. And if you introduce uh, antihypertensive medication, they feel very bad, and they will not comply with the medication because they don't like it, right? An acute colic episode is clearly a significant um, 
significant, has a significant impact on the patient, but it does not let, leave the patient in fear like, for example, a cancer diagnosis. Health system related factors is well, obviously what kind of health system do you have, how far is it to the next hospital, how good organized are the clinics, what kind of health care can be provided. You have social economic factors, which are again poverty, um, and you have therapy related factors. Um, how, what is the impact of the therapy? How um, unpleasant is it for the patient to have a therapy? For example, a radical prostatectomy um, was in earlier times, or still is, has a significant impact on the patient's quality of life, so the patient will have, will fear that, right? Having a lithotripsy, the patient will not fear. So all those five dimensions are involved into compliance, right? Let's crack on. This is actually, this slide summarizes um, what I've just said, and this was published in the Arab Journal of Urology by a German group. Um, I will jump over that. Um, so, compliance in general, one word is overestimated, right? Um, we think patients do what we tell them, and they tell us we do what you tell us, but at the end of the day, they go home and most likely do not what we tell them. So, only 50% of the chronic ill follow the recommendations given. 50% chronic ill, right? And we're going to see that 20% to 30% of our prescriptions are never filled out, so they're just binned. And the asthma non-compliance is up to 70%. Asthma is a scary disease, and you would think that everybody suffering from that disease would actually take the medication or would comply very well. It's not the case. You can imagine how compliance to uh, urethiasis prevention is. Hypertension non-compliance, as I stated before, is maximum. You cannot get a worse compliance as in terms of hypertension treatment. So, how is the compliance in urolithiasis? 51% did not remember the therapy regimen. That was a statement made by Drongelen in 1998 already. Only 44% have been compliant to medication, although I think that's overestimated and we don't know how long they have been actually complying to that. Um, that's diet. People say, yes, I comply to the diet, I don't eat uh, a lot of salty food, I try to have a healthy Mediterranean diet, a lot of fruits and vegetables. Why are they obese? High fluid intake, nearly every patient I see states that he is compliant to high fluid intake. However, we don't measure it and this is very subjective. So, the compliance, as I already mentioned before, depends on the degree of symptoms and on the inconvenience of treatment. And we know that if patients are already on a lot of medications, they comply usually better because they're used to do it. Women are less compliant to medication and fluid, okay? And men are less compliant to diet. Men are known to treat their body worse than women, right? Because they think the body needs to function for a long time, and it does, and suddenly it breaks down. Um, all the patients are more compliant. Why are they more compliant? Because they're wiser, and they went through more, so they're not that aggressive anymore. Um, so how can we improve compliance now? Um, it's improving compliance needs to be based on communication with the patient, right? So everything we say needs to be precise, simple, understandable. We should start slowly, one recommendation each visit, Another recommendation, we need to take it slow, we need to be simple, we need to be supportive, we should not blame, we should not raise the finger, and we should take small steps. So that's simple psychology, but everybody knows he wants to get a patient out quickly, a lot of patients waiting, so that usually is rarely done. Um, in terms of communication, we need to set transparent, achievable targets, we need to highlight and clarify the benefits, for the patient, if he complies, we need to be motivating and we need to be honest. We need to say, okay, although you comply, although you drink a lot of fluid, although you do a lot of sport, although you normalize your weight, you ha can have another stone recurrence and we need to make sure that that can happen. And we need to take multi-level approaches. What is meant by multi-level approaches? We need not only to talk to the patient, we need to talk to the partner, we need to talk to the family, we need to talk to the caregiver. We need to involve, the more we involve, the better. We should have 
written information leaflets, right? Or on our homepage, we should have something for patients who cannot read. We should have something with images on it. We should promote self-control. We should tell the patient, you are responsible. You are in charge. You can do it. And we should stick to fixed follow-up appointments where people are in the regular schedule, come back to our stone clinic and are regularly seen and tested on compliance. So that's a stepwise approach um, which has been proposed. So we start with the cheapest and easiest. And the cheapest and easiest is talking, information. Then we start on the intervention side with the most effective and the least harmful, and this is the fluid intake. We will rarely do anything wrong. And then we crack on to the more ambitious things which are changing the eating habits and changing the lifestyle habits. What everybody knows, it's quite a difficult thing to do. And the last step should be we give um, medication, we add medication like citrate um, to our um, treatment regimen. So, um, there Parks uh, recently published a, um, I proposed a regimen to um, increase compliance. So what he did when he has seen the patients initially, he has done an initial evaluation, checked for the risk factors, metabolic evaluation. Um, then he initiated a treatment regimen. He has seen the people six or eight weeks later in his clinic again. He did another metabolic evaluation and checked if the people actually complied and he changed the regimen if needed. And then he had annual follow-ups. So he, like the surgeon does, you do, you check, and if necessary, you adjust. And um, there is um, data that if you have a specialized stone clinic where you can, you don't run a generalized urology clinic, you have a specialized clinic where you focus on the needs of the patient, there you have, you can decrease the annual number of surgical interventions needed in a specific group. And those um, those working group who published this quite highly in the European Urology have been able to nearly half, half the number of interventions needed um, in one year for the group of recurrent stone formers by introducing a program for metaphylaxis, having proper follow-up protocols, timing the investigations properly, and giving the patients more time on the consultation. So what else can we do apart from leaflets and uh, having something on the home page? we can put videos on YouTube. So that's a very nice um, study uh, published in Urology. And they looked actually how many useful or how many videos about uh, urolithiasis are on the net. And they found that there are about 200 videos on the net at that, at that point. And um, they rated between useful and misleading videos. And actually, the majority has been useful. And um, that has been. Um, rated to by the views of the users because the useful videos, they have been filtered because people realize they are useful and viewed them more frequently. So I think it's a good opportunity for everybody, for every institution to put a good, useful video on the net. This will help the patient and this will promote your institution. So I would strongly encourage that. There's another project we have done with the Erasmus Medical Center from Rotterdam, from Rotterdam Mr. Cook. Um, this is the, the homepage, www.nierstein.com. Under this homepage, you have um, a, the possibility to put in your diet habits, fluid intake, your um, degree of physical activity, and your lifestyle. And this will give you, calculate your risk of stone formation, and it will help you to protocol this and maintain and eventually change your diet. And this is a screenshot. So you can see you can put your data in there and you basically have an all-around workup of your eating, drinking um, habits and of your fluid intake, your activity, and then you um, have calculated um, a, um, you, you get recommendations how to maintain that or how to improve that. So, and now, actually, I pressed too quickly. We're already on the closing words. Um, but this is a statement made in the Cochrane database from Mr. Haynes. Increasing compliance may have a far greater impact on the health of the population than any improvement in specific medical treatments. Because what are we doing if we are developing a new treatment? We are, we are, we are dealing with percent, 10% to 12% 
10% uh, to 9%, whatever we're doing, it's only, it's very small. And if we are able to, um, to get it on the route and to uh, increase the compliance, then I think we will be able to do really something good for our patients. Thank you very much.